students can get to hear firsthand from scientists about their research and hopefully find something interesting that they would like to take on uh, or tackle in their future research endeavors. So with that, uh, what I'm going to start is uh, my, my talk. And my talk is really going to be in two parts. The first half of the talk is going to be a lot of introduction and uh, you know, getting you to be familiarized with what we work on and why we work on that. And then I'm actually going to take you through one of our studies. <clears throat> so you get some idea about how the research is thought about, how we conduct it and how do we take it you know, one step further ahead? How do we ask the questions that we ask? So uh, the title of my talk is Host Pathogen Interaction, the Crosstalk between Infected Host and the Invading Pathogen. And as you just heard, the pathogen that I work on is called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And the disease that it causes is tuberculosis, which as we know is an important disease. And tuberculosis today is in spite of the coronavirus pandemic, it still is the leading cause of death due to any single infectious agent. It caused 1.4 million deaths in 2019, and the numbers have been more or less the same for the last 10 years or so. And this is for a disease that is curable and preventable. Okay, so just compare it with respect to the coronavirus, which all of you have heard about in you know the recent times so much. Uh, this is a disease that is curable, preventable, yet we have such a high disease burden and yet we have such high numbers of deaths. So clearly, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis, is one of the smartest pathogens out there. Uh, and, you know, we get about 10 million new cases annually, which is like the tip of the iceberg in terms of the actual number of cases for TB worldwide. That's because latent TB accounts for more than 80% of, or more than 70% of the cases that are out there. So 2.5 million billion infected individuals have no overt disease symptoms and are therefore not detected to be TB positive, yet they have latent TB. So we have a huge reservoir globally of individuals who are infected and can reactivate the disease under conditions such as malnutrition, smoking, diabetes, and HIV infection. All of these conditions lead to some level of immunocompromise, which leads to reactivation of a latent infection. And that's why TB is like a ticking time bomb. So what really makes TB difficult to beat? As I said, one of the issues is latency. So if 70% of the world pop, uh, of the infected cases, actually more than 70% of the infected cases are uh, latent infections, then we have a huge reservoir that we can't tackle with drugs at this point. We don't tackle that with drugs, right? And uh, the infection itself doesn't offer protection. So typically what happens when you get infected with the pathogen is once you get infected, you develop an immune response to it and that immune response, either in terms of antibodies or uh, uh, antibodies and the cell mediated immune response offers some protection such that when you encounter the pathogen again, you're protected. But in case of tuberculosis, infection itself does not confer protection. So you do need a vaccine and the vaccine that we have for TB, which is uh, the BCG vaccine is an excellent vaccine However, it works only in children. So it's not found to be protective in adults that much. It's great because it prevents children from um, getting tuberculosis in the age group of, uh, you know, two to 10 years, uh, of zero to 10 years of age rather. Uh, so it's excellent, but it doesn't cover the entire population uh, or the, the age range that it needs to protect against. Uh, we can't detect the bacteria very efficiently. So for example, if you have TB of the lungs, which is a majority of TB cases worldwide, um, you will have bacteria detected in the sputum, but all individuals who have bacteria, uh, bacteria detected by culture may not be detected by microscopy-based methods. And all individuals who have overt symptoms may not have bacteria detectable either by culture or by microscopy. So there always remain some individuals who 
have the characteristic symptoms of TB, may even respond to the antibiotics, but they may not, uh, they, they may not be able to uh, be diagnosed correctly. So this is for a disease where, uh, or a disease condition, where you have a person coughing up the sputum, the sputum can be isolated uh, and the bacteria can be detected from that by you know, molecular tools or by microscopy tools. But there are also situations wherein the bacteria may be buried deep within the tissues. So for example, when you have uh, CNS TB or, or an individual has bone TB, these can be really debilitating conditions because of tuberculosis. But the patient sample is not accessible for doing the diagnostics. And even if the sample is available by invasive methods, as opposed to sputum, you know, which can be easily collected. If you have to collect a sample of the uh, cerebrospinal fluid for diagnosis, one, it's an invasive method. Secondly, the bacterial numbers in these diseases are so low that it becomes difficult to detect them by usual molecular tools. So again, the diagnosis is not perfect to cover all types of tuberculosis in humans. As I mentioned, the bacteria may be hiding in some cases. Now this problem of bacteria hiding is really that the bacteria may be present in deeper tissues, which makes it inaccessible to these diagnostic methods. And it also makes it inaccessible sometimes to antibiotics. So for example, um, some antibiotics have very poor penetration across the blood-brain barrier or even in damaged bone tissue. So it becomes difficult for the right amount of antibiotic, which you might be taking orally, to reach to these deeper tissues. And therefore, the bacteria will get low levels of antibiotic. They will encounter low levels of antibiotic. And therefore, they, as a result of encountering a low level of antibiotic, the bacteria up their game. So they increase expression of mechanisms of pathways that will allow the bacteria to tolerate even higher doses of antibiotic. So this is something that leads to antibiotic tolerance. So you, the individual may continue taking antibiotics, but the antibiotics do not have the same effect that they should on bacteria in let's say a culture dish. So that these are the kind of problems that make uh, treating or beating TB really difficult in the human population. So, um, you know, and the next three slides, I'm actually going to be uh, just highlighting some of the seminal work that, and it starts off with one of the first people who got the Nobel Prize, Robert Koch, who uh, identified mycobacterium tuberculosis as a causative pathogen for uh, tuberculosis. And what I'm trying to highlight here is that so much important work has gone on to you know, identify the bacteria, uh, identify methods of treatment, and yet we are still tackling with such a high burden uh, against um, a burden of tuberculosis. So clearly, you know, TB is not uh, as old as 1905. TB has been uh, with us for centuries. In fact, the oldest reports are of uh, uh, TB bacilli, uh, you know, being recovered from mummies in Egypt. So even from um, mummified uh, tissues, if a mummified, uh, um, you know, uh, people, if bacteria can be recovered, that just tells you how old this association between mycobacterium tuberculosis and the human host has been. And it's not that this has been a static association. There are now lots of evidences that the bacteria has evolved across ages um, and it has evolved as it has moved uh, across countries as well. So there is a, a very interesting field of uh, bacterial evolution and uh, that, that's basically telling us how bacteria is becoming even more virulent over uh, ages. Okay, so now uh, coming back to Robert Koch. So what was already known by the work of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, clinician, Dr. Jean Antoine uh, Willemann, uh, who had demonstrated that TB was in fact a transmissible disease. Uh, however, it was not known what leads to the transmission. So what Robert Koch developed was actually a new staining method, and he developed a solid media for growth of the pathogen. So by 
developing these some seemingly simple methods in his lab, he was able to finally identify culture the bacteria that causes mycobacterium uh, that causes tuberculosis. Okay, and from his work, not just with tuberculosis but also with uh, anthracis, where he identified uh, Bacillus anthracis to be the causative agent for uh, anthrax. Uh, he came with these postulates, which are called the Cox postulates. So what these postulates state is, uh, so these postulates um, basically define how you can um, call a pathogen as the causative pathogen for a particular disease. So what he stated was that the microorganism must be found in diseased but not healthy individuals the microorganism must be cultured from the diseased individual. And that's where his staining method and his uh, solid media allowed him to verify this particular postulate or, or apply this postulate to the case of tuberculosis. Uh, inoculation of a healthy individual with the cultured microorganism must recapitulate the disease, which it did in this case. So animals could be infected with the microorganism that he cultured in vitro and the um, the animal became, uh, you know, developed disease as a result of it. And the microorganism must be re-isolated from the inoculated diseased individual, in this case, an animal, and matched to the original microorganism. So all of these postulates held true for his own discovery of mycobacterium tuberculosis as the causative agent for tuberculosis. And then, um, you know, came the era of antibiotics. Antibiotics. Uh, so if anybody here would like to guess who this person is based on the plate that I've shown on the side, uh, anybody who wants to answer can unmute themselves and answer this. Alexander Fleming. Yes. So the giveaway on this slide, if, if you, if you don't recognize this space, it should be this colony of penicillium growing on a plate of bacteria. So there is an area of inhibition of uh, bacterial growth just outside the penicillium, penicillium colony. And that's because this was producing uh, penicillin. And this is what Alexander Fleming discovered in 1928. So this was the birth of antibiotics. And, you know, it's an interesting uh, Thing that penicillin doesn't really work for tuberculosis. It does work very well for many other um, uh, bacteria, but unfortunately it doesn't for TB and we can address that later why it doesn't. Again, he got the Nobel Prize for his discovery in the year 1945. And here is Selman Waxman. He got the Nobel Prize in 1952 and he had a very interesting approach he found that something in soil could prevent growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So from this something in soil, he was able to, by a, 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 a process of uh, isolation, extraction of uh, active ingredients from different soil samples, he was able to isolate streptomycin from the soil, uh, soil organism streptomyces griseus. And this really led to the uh, first ever trial of antibiotics against tuberculosis. So it was in the year 1946 that the first ever trial of streptomycin was done against tuberculosis. And it seemed to work, unfortunately, it also led to resistance. And those resistance, cases of resistance were found within the first year of rolling out this antibiotic into trials. So from that started the journey of antibiotics against tuberculosis. And uh, what followed is a series of different trials where it was understood that if you took only a single antibiotic, you would actually have the bacteria rapidly uh, developing antibiotic resistance against that particular antibiotic. And that you would need multiple antibiotics to actually uh, you know, control this bacterium. So they, uh, since then, we have had many different combinations. And finally, the combination that is the frontline uh, anti-TB therapy is a combination of these antibiotics, isoniazid, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, and rifampicin. And they target really different aspects of the bacteria. Uh, 
So for example, isoniazid targets synthesis of this very complex fatty acid, which is present in the cell wall of mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's called mycolic acid. Ethambutol targets the synthesis of the cell wall arabinogalactin, which is the sugar, which is present as a um, sort of uh, uh, just outside the inner membrane. So it's that typical cell wall architecture, except in case of, so in E. coli, you have peptidoglycan. In case of mycobacterium tuberculosis, you have arabinogalactin peptidoglycan. So this very thick layer of sugar, the synthesis of this layer is what is inhibited by ethambutol. Uh, rifampicin is a RNA polymerase inhibitor, so it prevents transcription. Pirazinamide has several known targets, but essentially what it uh, leads to is uh, a slowing down of the metabolism of the bacteria. So it causes toxicity because it inhibits coenzyme A biosynthesis. It also alters the membrane potential, and it also affects mycolic acid biosynthesis. Besides that, there are injectables like uh, canamycin that are used, and both streptomycin and canamycin work against the translation machinery of the bacteria. Now, while this has been the frontline uh, combination of antibiotics against TB for a very long time, thankfully this year, we have a new combination which really targets uh, very interesting aspects of the bacteria. So for example, bedaquiline is an ATP synthase inhibitor, okay? And pret pretomenid is another um, um, you know, molecule that targets mycolic acid biosynthesis by a different mechanism altogether. Linozolate is a new class of anti-translation uh, um, drugs or uh, it's a translation blocker. So this combination of bedaquiline, pretomenid, and linozolate is the next regimen uh, that has been approved after this four drug regimen. Uh, you know, I think it's more than uh, 40 years since uh, a new regimen was uh, developed, 50 years actually. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, this regimen is right now uh, advocated for treatment of XDRTB or extremely uh, drug resistant tuberculosis, but not for the frontline, uh, not, not for the uh, drug sensitive tuberculosis, for which we have this. Uh, very good combination of isoniazid, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, and rifampicin. So we have a huge arsenal against TB in terms of antibiotics. But we also know that the bacteria has the ability to develop resistance against each of these. Okay, And the more antibiotics that we will develop, the more antibiotic resistance mechanisms we will encounter. But that doesn't mean we do not develop these, right? We are at a stage where we need more antibiotic targets. We need more antibiotics to deal with uh, these targets and control the growth of bacteria or kill the bacteria. So what do we look for in new drug targets? One, it should weaken the bacteria. So it should be something that affects an essential pathway of the bacteria. But there's, an, uh, there's also an alternative approach to thinking about how we can tackle TB, which is strengthening the host defense. Now, as I mentioned that, uh, you know, 30% th of the world's population is latently infected with tuberculosis. Uh, then, and the, the chance of reactivation is increased if the individual has a weakened immune system then one can imagine that if you can strengthen the host defenses that lead to control of bacteria and improve the tissue health for the individual, then there is another alternative way of controlling the bacteria and decreasing the symptoms that the individual faces as a result of infection. So how do we do that? So for that, let's look at the natural course of TB infection. So. As I mentioned, an individual can inhale the bacteria through aerosols uh, with a good innate immune response or with a good acquired immune response, the individual may be able to control the infection. However, as I said, 30% of the world population, which is latently infected, is latently infected because it has been able to control the infection but is not exhibiting any clinical symptoms. 
So what's allowing this individual to latently control the infection is the formation of a granuloma, which is basically an accumulation of cells of the immune system that come to the site of infection and produce an arsenal of antimicrobial defenses, which help control the infection and recruit more and more inflammatory cells such that this focus of infection is limited to that particular site. And there's no dissemination from this original site to the rest of the body. So this is the primary function of this granuloma formation. However, because of these uh, uh, you know, conditions that lead to weakening of the immune system, there can be activation or uh, disruption of this granuloma, resulting in increased growth of the bacteria from the original site. And it can be increased growth even at that particular site. So now the individual would be having disease, but would be subclinical. However, if the disease goes beyond a certain limit, there is a widespread disease within the lung and even elsewhere in the body, the individual will um, uh, present with active TB disease with symptoms that you know, makes the individual go to the clinic and get tested. Now, across this entire range, if we look at the kind of host pathogen interactions that are happening, you can imagine that they'll be very different at this stage where the individual is trying to fight the initial inoculum of infection. They will be very different in the latent TB infection to when it will be an active TB disease. And it's the active TB disease that we need to think of when we're trying to come up with new strategies, right? So the environment in this uh, uh, you know, condition where the patient has an active disease may be very different from what it is in a subclinical disease or even within a latent TB infection. So understanding this interaction is key to the questions that we ask in our research. So just to give you a, a, a real picture of what a granuloma would look like. So on the left here is a solid granuloma, which uh, what you're looking at is actually a section of the lung. In this case, this is guinea pigs, and it looks very similar to what is found in humans. So you have these large air spaces, right? This is your typical... Uh, uh, histology uh, picture in uh, the lung, where you have large air spaces, uh, air spaces that allow for air exchange. Uh, this is the bronchiole, and you can see the bronchial wall is thickened in this case. That's because of inflammation. And this is a classical uh, granuloma. Right? So this is infiltration of cells of the immune system. And if we were to stain this with a stain that uh, uh, would be able to detect mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is acid fasting, you will find at high uh, magnification, you'll be able to see rod-like uh, structures present in this region. Uh, this uh, section on the right, as opposed to that on the left, is called a necrotic granuloma, which is what would be present in an actively infected individual. And what you have in this is a region in the center where you have no cells. That's because the cells have actually died because of necrosis. So this type of cell death is typical of mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. You see some uh, red patches here. Those are red blood cells. Uh, uh, so those are uh, blood vessels, basically. So you have uh, vasculature reforming around the edges of the granuloma. You have a huge number of uh, um, macrophages and T cells infiltrating into the uh, granuloma. Mm -hmm. However, what you have at the center is a region which is acellular. Interestingly, there are bacteria present both in this uh, central region as well as this region, which is lighter in color around the central necrosis. So if I were to draw it out and simplify it for you, uh, which is based on many, many years of research into the structure of the granuloma, what you would have is a lot of extracellular bacteria present in the center where you have dying cells like neutrophils and macrophages. And just around that, you have macrophages which are filled with lipids in them. And these cells are also harboring mycobacterium tuberculosis. 
So what are these cell types that are harboring bacteria and have a lot of lipid? So these are the cell types that we focus on. They're called foamy macrophages because when we stain them in histology uh, using um, hematoxylin and eosin, uh, the stain gets picked up by the cytosol and the nucleus, but these vesicle-like structures, because they don't take up any of these stains, they, the section actually appears more foam-like. So they are called foam cells, but really what they are are cells that have a large amount of lipid stored in them in the form of these organelles called lipid droplets. Okay, so now zoom in into the organelles or the interactions of our interest. So we are interested in understanding host pathogen interaction within cells that have lipid loaded in them. So these are macrophages that have high amount of lipid loaded in them. And we want to understand the role of this lipid for the bacterium, how the bacterium manipulates these lipid stores, and what would be the outcome of preventing bacteria from manipulating these lipid stores for the you know, course of infection. So uh, what's known from our work and work from several of our colleagues across the world is that bacteria can be present within membrane bound organelles. So these kind of structures within the cell. They can also be present in, in the cytosol without a membrane bound um, structure. They can also be present within these lipid droplets. And they, uh, when they are present outside or inside um, uh, membrane bound organelles, they could be in constant touch with these lipid droplets. So this is, uh, this seems to be, you know, a, a playground for the bacteria where they can have multiple sorts of interactions or multiple sorts of games that they can play with the lipid stores of the host cell. So why this is interesting, why this relationship between lipid and mycobacterium tuberculosis is interesting and fascinating to us is because if you look at the, um, genome sequence of mycobacterium tuberculosis, you will realize that there is a much higher abundance of genes that are involved in lipid metabolism in mycobacterium tuberculosis as opposed to other bacteria. So clearly the bacteria have the ability to metabolize lipids than any other known bacteria. So, you know, maybe it is adapted to utilizing lipids of the host and given that there is such intricate uh, relationship physically between the bacteria and the lipid droplets, we wanted to understand how bacteria is manipulating lipid droplets of the host. And uh, these are the students in the lab who have been working on several aspects of this uh, lipid remodeling in TB infection, both from the standpoint of the host and the bacteria. And the work that I'm going to talk about today is mostly done by uh, Dilip here and Korup. Um, and basically our fascination really uh, kicked off by you know, imaging cells under the microscope. So um, what you're looking at here are macrophages and uh, they're moving about because they're uh, live in a dish and uh, the vesicle-like structures or the little um, balls that you see labeled in red here, are actually labeled with a dye that stains neutral lipids. So these lipid droplets are neutral lipids. So they are cholesterol esters and triglycerides. And um, because of their neutral nature, they get packaged very efficiently into these organelles called lipid droplets. And what we uh, are looking at in green are mycobacteria. So this is mycobacterium bovis BCG, the vaccine strain of uh, um, M. bovis, which is a cow uh, pathogen that causes uh, tuberculosis in cattle, basically. Um, so we use this for uh, you know, these kind of live cell imaging experiments because it's non-pathogenic, so we can use it in our live imaging facility. And what we were fascinated by is the fact that uh, the bacteria seem to be latching on to these lipid droplets and moving about in the cell associated with these lipid droplets. And 
these are uh, images done over uh, 10 to 16 hours and we can see repeatedly that there seems to be this sort of natural love of the bacteria for lipid droplets. So it made sense to us to question what is it at the molecular level about uh, the interaction. And, you know, when I say the bacteria could be manipulating the lipid droplet, it's important to keep it in the context of what is already known about the ability of bacteria to manipulate the host. And what's known, sorry, let me just take a... So what's known already is the fact that um, bacteria, once it's taken up by the host cell, has several fates, okay? The macrophage could kill the bacteria altogether, uh, or the bacteria could actually be inside a membrane-bound compartment, like I said, in which it can resist being killed. It can resist and getting killed by resisting one, fusion with a low uh, pH environment like the lysosome. It can also escape this membrane bound compartment by permeabilizing this compartment, which gives it easy access to nutrients within the cytoplasm. It can also escape uh, from this uh, into the cytoplasm, get marked by the host for degradation and still resist the recycling autophagosome uh, compartment or it can undergo damage. So there are several different uh, routes that can um, take place after a bacteria, uh, after mycobacterium tuberculosis encounters the host. But given that in organisms or in model systems where the disease does ensue, where bacterial growth is permitted, several of these features of escape and resisting are evident. And it's known that this endo, uh, phagosomal system is highly manipulated by MTB, both by secretion of, you know, virulence factors that allow these different steps to take place. So for example, ESX1 secretion system is what allows this permeabilization of the bacteria. Similarly, there are lipids of mycobacterium tuberculosis that prevent its uh, 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 the ability of its compartment to fuse with the lysosome and therefore it allows it to resist this recycling mechanism. So now the question was how does an organelle which is sitting outside the uh, uh, endocytic com uh, compartments how does that get manipulated? Question number one does it actually get manipulated? Right? So now I'm showing you the lipid droplet in a little bit more uh, resolution uh, and I'm introducing you to the fact that it is also a membrane bound compartment. Okay, so the structure that you see at the bottom is a cartoonish version of what a lipid droplet would be. It would be filled with neutral lipids like triacylglycerol and cholesterol esters and have a monolayer of phospholipids as opposed to a usual bilayer, which is present in uh, plasma membrane, endoplasmic reticulum membrane, and uh, all other membranes of the cell. In addition to these uh, phospholipids present on the membrane of uh, lipid droplets, you have a large number of proteins which decorate the surface of the lipid droplet as well. And it's that particular composition of proteins that we wanted to study. Uh, before I get into all of that, let me give you a few slides on the uh, uh, the nature of lipid droplets and how they, they participate in several different processes within the cell. So, uh, you know, lipid droplets are lipid, uh, neutral lipid storage organelles. They originate at the endoplasmic reticulum um, because the enzymes that are involved in synthesis of triglycerides and cholesterol ester are actually present in the ER membrane. So what you have is this neutral lipid gets made uh, in the leaflet, between the leaflets of the ER membrane. And as they accumulate, as an action of increased phospholipid synthesis, as well as proteins coming to the surface from the cytosol, uh, surface of the lipid droplet, this lipid droplet eventually pinches out into a distinct organelle called the lipid droplet. And 
once a lipid droplet is formed, it can have interactions with several different compartments within the cell. So for example, uh, lipid droplets can interact with mitochondria and this allows the fatty acids from um, you know, uh, neutral, uh, neutral lipid stores like triglyceride. So triglyceride can be degraded to give rise to uh, fatty acids. That fatty acid will then need to go to the mitochondria for beta oxidation. So having this association of mitochondria and lipid droplets allows this transfer of fatty acid to take place in a more efficient manner. And it is in this uh, compartment that the mitochondria will now be able to generate energy from the oxidation of fatty acids. In addition, the, uh, the lipid droplets can also interact with degradative compartments like the lysosome and uh, wherein the, uh, the uh, lysosomes can degrade uh, the lipids present in the lipid droplet and this results in degradation of the stored lipid as well. So this, these are some uh, ways by which uh, lipid is made and once it's made it can also be its degradation can also be regulated by interacting with other organelles of the cell however we don't know how lipid droplets uh, interact with bacteria that are present inside the cell once the cell is infected uh, in addition to you know playing um, a role in just uh, fatty acid um, providing fatty acids when the cell needs it Lipid droplets also serve as donors of signaling lipids. And uh, these are basically uh, derived from uh, fatty acids such as arachidonic acid. And several of these like thromboxane, prostaglandins and lipoxins are all derivatives or oxygenated derivatives of arachidonic acid, which have a huge role to play in uh, recruiting inflammatory cells or dampening the inflammatory response during the course of infection. And several of the enzymes that are involved in degrading triglycerides and phospholipids to generate the arachidonic acid are also present on the surface of lipid droplets. So this serves like a depot on which enzymes are activated in response to, um, you know, the immune cues allow arachidonic acid to be released efficiently such that it can generate prostaglandins and lipoxins in a very fast manner. Besides all of this, as I mentioned, that it's, it's intriguing how an intracellular pathogen would be able to interact with these lipid droplets to derive nutrients. So there are some examples out there, and I'd just like to uh, share some of them with you. So chlamydia trachomatis uh, is a pathogen, again, an intracellular pathogen, which uh, generates parasite reticulate bodies that uh, uh, live within a parasitophorous vacuole. So this green structure here is a parasitophorous vacuole. And these uh, structures here are cytosolic lipid droplets, which are actually recruited within the parasitophorous vacuole by enzymes such as LDA3 uh, or proteins such as LDA3, which are released by the, uh, by the parasite itself. So parasite releases some proteins that latches onto the cytosolic lipid droplets and recruits them inside where they can be degraded to derive fatty acids that are then used by the parasite. So very clever mechanism of utilizing host lipids. Viruses are another very interesting uh, class of uh, pathogens which utilize lipid droplets. And you would know that Viruses don't necessarily need energy uh, for their own replication as the uh, uh, bacteria require energy production within their compartment, but the viruses really use this uh, uh, energy and the, the membrane systems of the host to build their replicate, uh, you know, the, their uh, uh, replication competent progeny. So the viral genome has to be assembled for a, a replicative virion particle to be generated that can be released from the infected cell and go on to infect other cells. So for this, what is important is the formation of a replication complex within the cell. And that replication complex requires new phospholipid biosynthesis. And this phospholipid synthesis is happening very close to lipid droplets 
because the lipotropids uh, that store triglycerides, the triglycerides are actually uh, first getting degraded as a result of uh, viral enzymes, viral encoded enzymes, and that results in new phospholipid synthesis on which the structural proteins of the viruses along with the viral genome assemble and these uh, new virion particles can be generated. Another advantage of having a uh, secluded replication complex bilayer formed within the cell is that the viral sensing mechanisms of the host cell, which are basically sensors of DNA and RNA of non-host origin, will be recognized by the host, uh, host sensing mechanisms and will lead to degradation of DNA and RNA. So if this uh, pathway is activated, the foreign DNA or RNA will get degraded. This is a typical antiviral response. There are some viruses that are able to sequester their genomes into these replication complexes, thereby preventing access of their own uh, you know, uh, genetic uh, elements to these host sensing uh, mechanisms, thereby preventing from getting recognized. So they protect their genome from getting recognized by associating with these lipid droplets. Now, coming back to mycobacterium species. So as I mentioned that in case of mycobacteria, the association between lipid droplets and bacteria has been found in many different instances. And uh, we are yet to figure out how this association is maintained or how this association is built. So uh, the questions that we were interested in asking is, first of all, do lipid droplets actually serve as a reservoir of fatty acids that the bacteria can use? And if it does, which can happen across uh, many different instances, like I mentioned, with and without membrane compartmentalization, how does this take place? So the first experiment that we did was we asked whether bacteria can actually induce degradation of the host lipid. And for this, we used a classical um, cellular biochemistry approach, wherein we labeled the host triglyceride pools with a fatty acid, which was radioactively labeled. So by introducing this fatty acid to cells that could utilize this fatty acid into the triglyceride pool, we had the pool of the host cell triglyceride labeled. Now we could chase the release of free fatty acids from this pool by resolving the cellular samples um, and the supernatant samples of the uh, cells on a thin layer chromatogram, which would be able to, uh, uh, you know, which, which allowed us to detect triglyceride and the free fatty acid. So we knew how much the cells had taken we were then measuring how much was released by cells over a period of time. And this release basically allows you to measure lipolysis being carried out by the cells. Now, the uh, funny thing about uh, this is that it is very difficult to measure this because the fatty acid can be re-esterified back to the triglyceride by the step called re-esterification. And we would block these re-esterification and oxidation steps so that we could measure the lipolysis. So by doing this, we were actually able to find that over a period of time, if you looked at the amount of fatty acid released by the cells, of course, the uninfected cells release some fatty acid, but the TB infected cells could release much higher levels of fatty acid over a period of time, suggesting that there is lipolysis happening upon infection, which is higher than that in uninfected cells. Now, to answer whether this was this release of fatty acid was really because of a lipolytic action or a lipase, we inhibited this process using lipases. And uh, I won't go into the details of the name. So basically, these are two different li lipase inhibitors at two different concentrations. And what we could see is a dose-dependent inhibition in the degree of lipolysis that was happening in response to infection, suggesting that indeed TB infection was leading to degradation of the stored triglyceride. So now that the lipid droplets uh, 
that are storing triglycerides are undergoing lipolysis, we know that this is a process that is triggered by infection. We wanted to measure this also by another way, which was by uh, microscopy. So, sorry. So, uh, to, in order to do this by microscopy, what we uh, relied on is this fluorescent fatty acid, which is a BODP tagged fatty acid. BODP is a fluorophore basically. And this fatty acid gets taken up by macrophages and it gets esterified into the triglyceride pool. Just like I mentioned that the radioactively labeled fatty acid gets incorporated into the triglyceride pool. Similarly, this fluorescent the uh, tagged fatty acid also gets incorporated into the triglyceride pool. And then you can visualize the lipid droplets of the cell in the cytoplasm. So um, after that, we infected the cells with mycobacterium tuberculosis and washed off the extracellular bacteria and then imaged the cells after, I think this was 16 to 24 hours post-infection. And we asked whether the bacteria contained the stain or not, the fatty acid stain or not. And uh, what you're looking at at the top is basically a merged image where blue uh, is the stain for the nuclei. The green, uh, which is shown here in grayscale, is the bacteria. And the red, which is shown here, uh, so red in the top panel is shown in the grayscale in the lower panel. And what you would be able to appreciate by looking at this image is that you have two types of staining patterns for this fluorophore. One is present in structures that look like lipid droplets. And secondly, you have it in structures that match or overlap with the bacterial signal. So what this told us is that the, uh, the stain that was taken up by the lipid droplets prior to infection has now been transferred to the bacteria. Now, again, if you wanted to determine whether this was a specific uh, process or not, you would actually have to inhibit the lipolytic process and ask whether you still see transfer or not. It could simply be an artifact of uh, you know, the, the handling process, the fixing process, the imaging process. So when we used an inhibitor of lipolysis, what we saw is that now the bacteria don't stain that well for the fatty acid, but they stain, but the lipid droplets of the host cell retain the dye much more than they did in the absence of the lipase inhibitor, telling us that lipolysis is responsible for transferring fatty acid from these lipid droplets, which are storing fatty acids, to the bacteria. Okay. So there are now two ways by which we've established that the triglyceride pool of the cell undergoes hydrolysis and that fatty acid is taken up by the bacteria. So now the question is, does MTB manipulate the lipid droplet proteome such that it can make access it, or it can gain access to the fatty acids that are present in the lipid droplet? And what we were hoping to um, you know, identify by asking this question are what are the lipases that help in this process? So in the next uh, few slides, I'm going to talk about the experimental approaches that we've taken to understand this process, um, whether there is manipulation of the lipid droplets or not, and if there is, then what is really changing? So um, just to tell you a little bit about the kind of proteins that are present on lipid droplets. So uh, lipid droplets um, can be of different sizes across different cells. And like in fat cells, you would have uh, really large lipid droplets that can range in size from um, you know, one micron all the way till uh, 20 or 30 microns. In a macrophage, these droplets are much smaller and typically uh, a lipid droplet would not be more than two microns wide in a macrophage. Uh, also, the coat proteins that are present on these droplets are very different across different cell types. So, for example, um, in adipocytes, you have a protein called perilipin-1, which is uh, visualized here in green. In case of macrophage, uh, the uh, protein that's being visualized in this case is perilipin-2. 
and perilipin 1 is absent in this case. So different proteins mark lipid droplets of different cell types, you know, differentially. So it's, uh, it becomes almost a cell type specific uh, protein composition of these organelles. And that's why studying them in the context of an infected cell becomes very important. So uh, first of all, how do we study these droplets? How do we identify the protein of these droplets? Uh, we can actually isolate these droplets because just like oil floats on top of water, these uh, droplets are, are highly buoyant. And therefore, if you perform sucrose uh, gradient ultracentrifugation, so you basically lyse the cells under high pressure, uh, you uh, take that cell lysate, uh, you process it so that you get a post-nuclear supernatant. So at this uh, 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 centrifugal fold, uh, force 900G, you would get rid of the nuclei and unlysed cells. And then that supernatant contains all the other organelles, including lipid droplets. You can uh, layer that at the bottom of a sucrose gradient and if you have, uh, you know, from highest concentration of uh, sucrose at the bottom to lowest concentration of sucrose at the top, and you apply very high centrifugal uh, forces to this uh, tube, you will basically have organelles separating from bottom to top on the basis of density. So the most buoyant fraction of the cell will be at the top. And that top fraction is typically your lipid droplet fraction. So we isolate that top fraction from these tubes and then try to verify whether it is a fraction that is enriched in triglycerides and is enriched in the kind of proteins that are expected to be present in the lipid droplet. So for example, a thin layer chromatogram, you can easily uh, see that uh, as, so just look at this lane that is labeled T, which is a total cell lysate. And the last uh, lane here, which is called the, uh, which is labeled LD, which is the lipid droplet fraction. And this is a standard that we have loaded for triglyceride. So you can see the enrichment of triglyceride and cholesterol ester. So this is cholesterol ester uh, in the lipid droplet fraction as opposed to the total cell lysate. So clearly we are enriching for the neutral lipids. Secondly, uh, these, um, uh, compartments, as I mentioned, have a monolayer of phospholipids, and the ratio of phospholipid to triglyceride is much lower than, uh, you know, in comparison to the ER membrane. And clearly, we do we actually see a depletion of phospholipids in this um, organelle fraction. So that's one way of ascertaining that the lipid droplet fraction that we're isolating is actually quite pure. Uh, secondly, we have um, uh, we run a battery of marker proteins. So for example, we want to make sure that the uh, fraction that we've collected as the lipid droplet fraction is actually uh, you know, highly abundant in proteins that are present on the lipid droplet. So as I mentioned, perilipin 2 is a marker. So it's written as plin 2 here, is a marker of lipid droplets. And clearly across all the fractions, the lipid droplet fraction was the one that had high abundance of perilipin 2. Across um, all of these, if you uh, so if you go from top to bottom, are basically markers of different uh, subcellular compartments. So calnexin is a marker for the endoplasmic reticulum. CAPTH is a marker for the cytosol. Lamin is a nuclear marker, and VDAC2 is a mitochondrial marker. So what this Western blotting result shows you is that this. Uh, first fraction from the top, which we are calling the lipid droplet fraction, is largely devoid of these other uh, subcellular contaminations, and it's enriched in the lipid droplet um, marker, which is perilipin 2. So this is how we isolate the lipid droplets, and we know that they're relatively pure. But how do we identify the protein composition of these droplets? So uh, in this, what we do is we use mass spectrometry, we take an unbiased approach essentially. So what we do is we isolate the organelle, which in this case is the lipid droplets. Now we have a mixture of proteins. So we precipitate the uh, proteins from this fraction and we have a mixture of proteins. These proteins are then digested using the enzyme trypsin 
and then uh, we run it through a liquid chromatography column at the end of which we ionize these peptides. So at this stage, at step four, we've got peptides. We pass them through a liquid chromatography column for separating them based on mass. And then we ionize each of them. So as these ion peptides uh, gain charge, they also, uh, under an electric field, they have the opportunity of uh, migrating differently towards a uh, uh, towards an electrode and it is uh, uh, so so the detector in a mass spectrometer is basically detecting these peptides based on their mass and charge so once a peptide is identified or peptide is detected it is further fragmented such that for each peptide you would get a signature of ions which you can basically, because you have 20 different types of you know, unique amino acids with unique molecular weights, you will be able to identify the sequence of a peptide based on how it is fragmenting. And this is uh, then, um, you know, uh, so, uh, what should I say, matched, this pattern of fragmentation is matched to an existing database of peptide fingerprints based on, uh, that would be, um, uh, you know, expected from degradation of the protein by trypsin and then by uh, ionization uh, or sorry, by the uh, mass spectrometer. And therefore that allows you to identify the protein to which this peptide matches. So that's from how you go from, you know, cell, subcellular organelle, all the way to identifying the composition of proteins. Now, the question that we had was not that what are the proteins present on the droplet? The question that we had was, how does mycobacterium tuberculosis alter the proteome of lipid droplets? So for that, what we had to do is we had to compare the lipid droplets of cells that are infected and not infected, or cells that are under two different conditions, right? So for this, uh, to be able to quantify the proteins across different conditions, uh, we use quantitative lipid drop, uh, quantitative proteomics. And if you can just focus for a bit on this large box here, which is, uh, you know, surrounded by this dashed line, this is the uh, essence of this methodology. So basically, the peptides that you get after trypsinization, you would be able to detect these in the mass spectrometer, right? But how do you know whether the quantity of a particular peptide or a particular protein is different across two samples? The best way to analyze this is if you are able to pool the peptides from different conditions. So if you want to compare sample one, two, three, four, five, let's say there are five different conditions. If you want to compare these, then they must be run into the mass spectrometer at the same time. But if you run them at the same time, you don't have a way of resolving which peptide came from which condition. So in order to resolve this, a very neat uh, technology that has been developed is called isobaric tag labeling. So isobaric tags are basically, uh, again, if you bring your focus to this uh, box within the, within the dashed line, you have these tags, which are basically small uh, molecules that can be attached to the end terminus of these peptides. And basically, you have different flavors of these tags. And all of them together are isobaric, which means that the total molecular weight of each of these tags is identical. Okay, But each of these tags has a reporter part and a balance part, which means that when you add both of these together, the colored part and the gray part, the molecular weight will be identical. So if you have peptide uh, A from all of these samples and they're tagged to this peptide tag or this peptide tag, the molecular weight, total molecular weight of peptide A remains the same across sample one and sample two. But when it is fragmented in the mass spectrometer, 
this reporter tag is released and this reporter tag is released and the size of this reporter tag is different from the size of this reporter tag which again the mass spectrometer can detect because it's the mass and the charge of a molecule that the detector will uh, identify and the ratio between the size of this reporter and the size of this reporter will give you a ratio of the abundance of this sample versus this sample so now imagine all the peptides of all the proteins of sample one are tagged with this red reporter, second one with the yellow, third one with the green, and so on and so forth. And finally, what you have is for each peptide that the mass spectrometer is detecting, you have the intensity of red, yellow, green, purple, blue, whatever the labels are, as a output. Now, you can identify ratios between each of these to tell you the relative abundance of a peptide A in this sample versus this sample. Okay, So this is in uh, a very simplified uh, manner telling you about how quantitative proteomics is done. This can be used, this methodology uh, was used by us to look at lipid droplet proteomes, but this methodology is uh, all pervasive and can be used for comparison of any different types of proteomes. So now, coming back to our question, we know that the myco with that mycobacterium tuberculosis is able to uh, modify or hijack intracellular uh, signaling events, intracellular trafficking events. We wanted to know how it affects an organ which is sitting outside. So what would be the best controls for doing that? Well, certainly uninfected cells, but also heat killed MTB would be a good control because uh, there are several responses that take place in a cell as a response to infection. So just by recognition of surface lipids, surface proteins of the bacteria, simply uh, the process of phagocytosis by the cell can also lead to some processes getting activated in the host cell. So what we wanted to know was what is it that MTB is actively able to do that will lead to um, you know, a change in the lipid droplet protein. So for that, we decided to use heat-killed MTB as a control. And uh, as I uh, mentioned in the uh, previous slide, that MTB is able to escape the phagosome. Uh, the same mechanism that allows it to permeabilize the membrane that it is present in within an endosome, it is also able to permeabilize the host cell and that leads to necrosis. Okay, so we wanted to make sure that uh, we don't have any such uh, events of cell death and necrosis happening as a response to infection when we are sampling the cells for the lipid droplets. So we compare different multiplicities of infection. Uh, multiplicity of infection is basically, if it's one, it means one bacteria to one macrophage. If it's 50, it means 50 bacteria to one macrophage. So we basically titrate the amount of bacteria that we're adding to macrophages. And what you can appreciate in this graph is that uh, if you take live MTB with an increase in multiplicity of infection, you get an increase in cell death. And uh, whereas with the heat killed MTB, you actually don't. So we wanted to take a condition where the uh, cell death was minimal by live MTB and it was comparable to that by heat killed MTB. And that was multiplicity of uh, infection of three. Uh, we could isolate the lipid droplets from these cells and overall get equivalent amount of the lipid droplet fraction. Um, whereas if we took a multiplicity of five, because it caused more necrosis, we also got lower amount of protein from these samples. So again, multiplicity of three was what was working best. Uh, now, we also wanted to make sure that because we're going to be isolating lipid droplets from you know, an entire monolayer of cells, we wanted to make sure that maximum amount of cells would be infected. And so we calculated how many cells get infected at different multiplicities of infection. So with MOI of uh, one, we get about 45% cells infected. MOI of three, we get about 72%. And at MOI five, we get about 77% infected. And because MOI three was giving us the least amount of cell death and uh, good yields of the lipid droplet proteins, we decided to take a multiplicity of infection of three with about 72% cells infected in this scenario. So now that we had 
the lipid droplets isolated. We uh, performed this isobaric uh, tag labeling. We compared, uh, we uh, ran two separate experiments where in each experiment we had heat killed MTB as a control and live TB as a test condition. And we compared the quantity of proteins that we identify in the lipid droplet. So we identified a total of 418 proteins by this method. And we took only 258 proteins for comparison because they were identified in all the technical replicates of our experiment. And from this 258 proteins, we identified 86 proteins to be either increased or decreased. So a fold change of greater than 1.3 or less than 0.7 is what we considered as differentially abundant. So if I say fold change of greater than 1.3, it basically means that this protein was at least 1.3 fold higher in live MTB infected cell compared to heat killed MTB infected cell. Okay. And um, basically after that, these 86 proteins, we tried to bin them into different kinds of functions. So if you have 86 proteins in hand and you want to figure out what are the different processes that these proteins could be involved in? We try to read up literature and we try to bin them into different classes. So for example, um, let's take a look at this last bar. Okay, so proteins involved in vesicular trafficking were the highest in number that were changing in any given direction. Okay, uh, similarly, we had proteins in metabolism which were both decreasing and increasing in response to infection, live MTB infection. So if you look across these different uh, categories, there are lots of different uh, categories of proteins that are changing. And really what we're trying to understand right now is how these proteins could be involved in uh, changing the outcome of infection. But for that, we really need to understand first what are the features of these proteins that allow them to localize to the lipid droplet. But uh, what uh, this work for the very first time showed is that there is an organelle beyond the endocytic compartment of the cell which can be hijacked by the host and you have different kinds of proteins uh, changing in abundance on the lipid droplet as a result of that. Now, what this quantitative change means in terms of infection is something that we need to figure out. I'll just skip through this in the interest of time and uh, summarize here that uh, what I told you today is that MTB infection leads to trafficking of fatty acids from lipid droplets towards the bacteria and MTB is actively able to manipulate the lipid droplet proteome. Protein functions that are affected at the lipid droplet proteome mainly included enzymes involved in lipid metabolism, some ribosomal proteins, and proteins involved in vesicular transport. And to, uh, uh, I mean, this is really the first evidence that MTB manipulates the proteome of an organelle beyond the endocytic compartment. So what do we, uh, what are we working on next? Uh, we're trying to address whether the localization to the lipid droplet is affecting the function of these proteins. So these proteins are not only present on the lipid droplet. They're also known to be present elsewhere in the cell. So, but is the function of the protein really different at the lipid droplet or not? Is lipid metabolism affected by these lipid droplet proteins? Okay, because they're localizing to the lipid droplet, do they have a direct role to play in lipid metabolism? Thirdly, what is the consequences of these proteins localizing to the lipid droplet on the outcome of infection? So these are some questions that we are actively pursuing in the lab. Uh, and these are uh, some of the people who've been involved in the work. So the lipid droplet work was uh, done in collaboration with uh, Keshav Prasad and Sneha Pinto at the University of Bioinformatics and Yenapoya University. And uh, Rintu and Devashish helped us with the uh, proteomics analysis. Uh, we have an extended team, which is Dr. Vivek Rao's team at IGIB. Uh, and I also would like to thank all the uh, funding that we've had for this work. And finally, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, attention to the talk. Hopefully, I didn't put off uh, you guys to sleep. And I hope to get some questions from you now. Uh, hello, ma'am. Can you just introduce yourself before you ask your question? Okay, ma'am. My name is Devra Saraswati, ma'am. 
and i have done the bachelor in pharmacy and uh, now currently i am pursuing the master in uh, uh, master msc in uh, science communication in csi laboratory in scare ma'am new delhi okay uh, and then ma'am ma my question is that ma'am uh, why uh, is tb still a problem in the united states ma'am why is it a problem in Why is TB still a problem in the United States, ma'am? Fever crosses, ma'am. Why in is what? I am not able to understand what you are saying. In what state? Why is fever crosses still a problem in the United States, ma'am? In United States. Yes, ma'am. Any? Uh, why do you ask that? Actually, ma'am, still uh, there. Uh, uh, it, it is. So, problem. why do you think it should not be a problem? Sorry, ma'am. Why do you think it should not be a problem? Uh, no, I mean actually as a mechanism and uh, uh, as a cellular functioning, and then I that's why I'm uh, asking, ma'am. Actually, so I, so there are there in there the, are in the, in the India, ma'am. Uh, actually, different uh, kind of immunity in the our body, ma'am. As as in the COVID nineteen situation, ma'am, different different plant country uh, in the peoples having the uh, different type of the immunity system, ma'am. So that's why I'm asking, ma'am, why is the TB still a problem in the United States, ma'am? So actually, actually the incidence of tuberculosis in the United States is much lower than it is in India and uh, even there the uh, individuals who are at higher risk of uh, tb um, uh, so th there is there are a lot of cases of uh, reactivation tuberculosis in individuals from africa and india which are uh, typically the countries of higher uh, tb burden um, but Uh, you know besides that it's not that people of european descent um, or uh, white ancestry are uh, protected from tb uh, completely right so there are um, instances where the immune system is um, compromised such as in hiv and that's where you have a huge incidence of uh, hiv tb co infections in the west okay ma'am Ma'am, uh, my second question, ma'am. Please let me know again, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, liquid droplets in immunity, ma'am, mm -hmm. with the tuberculosis, ma'am. Okay, yeah. So I didn't mention that today, but uh, this is also work uh, coming out from our lab. So we had actually asked this question that whether lipid droplets have any role to play in the control of infection, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what we did is we depleted cells of uh, lipid droplets by inhibiting the enzyme that is involved in triglyceride synthesis dgat1 and what we found is that in macrophages uh, if you deplete triglyceride it doesn't affect the growth of bacteria so triglycerides are not an essential carbon source for mtb it can gain tri uh, gain carbon sources from uh, i mean carbon from other sources other uh, metabolites as well but Uh, what we found is that the inflammatory response to infection was decreased in cells that had a decrease in triglyceride levels so we think that the uh, at the macrophage level the immune response is largely driven by the stored triglyceride and that could be one because of the role of triglycerides in producing these lipid mediators of inflammation two it could be that some proteins that localize to the lipid droplet could actually be disturbed in their function if you deplete cells of lipid droplets and that's something that we're trying to understand now okay ma'am and ma'am and my last last question ma'am ma'am uh, suppose if the patient already uh, uh, affected from the covid-19 ma'am sorry say that again if the person is already infected with covid-19 uh, yes ma'am uh huh and after, so, sorry ma'am um, uh, uh, previously affected uh, the tuberculosis Okay. Then, then affected the ma'am nineteen COVID virus ma'am. Then so in this case, what actually in the lungs ma'am? What, what happened in the lungs ma'am? So there is not a a large amount of data to tell us about uh, the consequences of co-infection, um, but given that the uh, given that TB causes a lifelong um, morbidity in terms of lung function, uh, a person who has had TB is going to be at severe uh, at an increased risk of having severe outcomes of infection simply because the compromise that has happened in the lung already because of tb infection although i do have to uh, uh, say that there are no large scale studies uh, 
uh, supporting or refuting that yet. So this is all a hypothetical answer that I am giving you. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Saksham this side from Delhi Technological University. I'm Hi, doing uh, I'm doing B uh, Tech in biotechnology as of now. Mm -hmm. uh, ma'am, I had a uh, question about. I have questions. Uh, I have three questions on different slides. Uh, ma'am, you mentioned that uh, tuberculosis, uh, the micro uh, microbacterium tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis can have different pathways in our uh, in our cell. In macrophages, it can damage it. It can escape it. So, what what are the parameters that they determine that what pathway that it will follow? Yeah, uh, great question. We don't have an answer to that. So, that is one of the uh, trickiest parts in working with tuberculosis. It is the heterogeneity. So, even if we look within an infected cell. You can have the same cell having some bacteria that are present in the lysosome or that continue to grow in the lysosome and some cells that are actually uh, present in maybe the cytosol, maybe in an early endosome. So you have different stages of infection recapitulated in a dish. Okay, and in within each cell, so across different cells, you can have heterogeneity, and even within the same cell, you can have heterogeneous populations of bacteria. What we do, however, know is that, for example, if you have a mutant that is not able to permeabilize, uh, that is not able to secrete these uh, virulence factors of the ESX1 machinery, uh, that is not able to permeabilize the phagosome, you get all, you get uh, no cytosolic escaped bacteria. You find bacteria only within um, uh, membrane bound compartments. And these bacteria are also amenable to degradation better. Okay. okay. So unless and until you have mutants for different steps, uh, you uh, so basically having these mutants allow you to understand what leads to uh, uh, you know, one pathway being favorable over the other. But if you just take wild type bacteria, you have basically a very heterogeneous uh, population of bacteria within and across macrophages. Ma'am, is it possible that the interaction of our cell cellular proteins with microbacterium is uh, uh, is the defining factor for what pathway it has to be uh, it has to take? Yeah, certainly. So, so uh, you can imagine that across individuals of different genotypes. Uh, yes, you could you could have some individuals that are able to maybe um, have a more efficient uh, membrane closure or a membrane healing process in which you would maybe get less bacteria escaping to the cytosol. Right? In genomics, we can find, uh, probably yes. we can find the answer to it. Uh, yes. So for, for those kind of studies, you actually need large uh, population data. It's but not. also, uh, uh, these kind of answers can also come from laboratory experiments, where you take mutants of, pro, uh, uh, you know, mutants in pathways that are known to, let's say, seal a membrane or let's say, a fuse two compartments together. So uh, you can understand what are the proteins that are involved in, uh, you know, promoting fusion or preventing fusion of uh, uh, compartments. And uh, maybe individuals that have a higher expression or baseline higher expression of these processes may be protected because they may just be able to overcome the bacteria's uh, sub, you know, abilities to subvert these processes. So these are very hypothetical um, because you really need a large amount of genetic data uh, to be able to get answers to the kind of questions you're asking. But certainly host genetics will play a role in this. Okay. Ma'am, uh, my second question is that you showed a video of mycobacterium being attached and being in the cell. Uh, so uh, in that in that video, we had uh, two cells in which the bacteria was inside the macrophages. Mm -hmm. And then uh, during the course of the video, we also saw that a few mycobacteriums were, uh, were moving around. Outside. The cell. Yeah, yes, they were outside. So, yeah. And you said that the vesicles are acting as an attachment point that they are to which they are moving. So outside the cell, we don't have any vesicles of lipid vesicles. Uh, 
so mm-hmm. how are they basically attaching to the vesicle oh so basically that's a, that's a, so that's extracellular bacteria so that's just an artifact of the way the experiment went so we had okay. some uh, so bacteria also cluster with each other right so that was just a clump of bacteria that was extracellular maybe it came from dying cells we don't know but it could be something that didn't get washed off when we stopped the infection so that's why we're seeing it in the media and in, in you're right in one of the frames it actually was moving across Yes, ma'am. Without vesicles, yeah. without. Yeah, so that was extracellular bacteria. Okay. Okay. So that probably didn't get removed when we removed the extracellular bacteria. Yeah. Okay, uh, ma'am. My last question will be, uh, ma'am. You told about the activity of lipases. Can you mm-hmm. please uh, recap? Can you please explain again okay. that how so, the lipases was active and. Okay. So so basic. So are you talking about um, both the, the TLC type. and the. the conversion of triglyceride to glyceride and the effect of that to microbacteria yeah, and so, the normal yeah so 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 uh, basically the way we are measuring this is uh, even even we do it biochemically or when we do it uh, by uh, uh, microscopy based methods we want to know how specific this process is so is it really that an esterified form of the lipid is releasing free fatty acid okay so the process itself would be inhibited if we were uh, if we were to use a lipase inhibitor and that is what happened so yeah. if we use a lipase inhibitor both the uh, release of fatty acid decreased and the transfer of fatty acid decreased so which tells us that it is a lipase driven process which is leading to this uh, detectable free fatty acid that we are seeing so if if we put a lipase inhibitor in our in our cell culture or anything uh, mm-hmm. in our medium so mycobacterium won't be able to transform that triglyceride into a, a monoglyceride into fatty acid so into so we don't acid. know we don't know if it is all the way converting triglyceride to glycerol uh, okay. we do know that the tri- one of the fatty acids of the triglyceride is being released which is what we are measuring okay yeah thank you ma'am any more questions uh anything if you this uh, want to discuss students we still have 5 minutes 3 4 minutes anything if you are doing uh, any projects or uh, if you have any query not only for this topic i think madam would be uh, happy to answer that yeah so either it was very clear or nobody understood what i said <laughs> so ma'am they are you know undergraduate students and they have uh, you know not access to uh, the laboratories as but uh-huh. so uh, so i that's why i try to have a mixture of Uh, the techniques as well because uh, i think undergraduate uh, students are really uh, interested to learn about different techniques as well right, right. Yeah. so uh, they uh, they might be not having the uh, that type of uh, research questions because many of they have not even started doing projects or okay station yeah they are just uh, you know, theoretical knowledge they are gaining right now so maybe, okay uh, they are we are just understanding what's going on okay okay so hopefully i was able to uh, acha someone has a question sanya um can bcg vaccine let me stop this can bcg vaccine act as an immune booster for covid-19 so uh, lots of speculation on this has gone on for very long and uh, the uh, the reason why this speculation started is because of the association between the prevalence of bcg vaccination and the incidence of covid-19 so countries that follow 
uh, BCG vaccination as part of the national vaccination program uh, seem, to ha seem to have lower incidence of COVID-19. And in addition, it's known that BCG vaccination also leads to protection of uh, babies from other sorts of um, infections. So not just, it just uh, doesn't just protect against tuberculosis, it also protects against a lot of unrelated infections, uh, including viral infections. And that is uh, because BCG is able to induce something called trained immunity, which means that it trains our monocytes to have a metabolic response that will be required for activating the cell in case another pathogenic insult comes. So it sort of primes the immune system for a heightened immune response that can be protective against viral infections. So given that that, that is quite well established, uh, there has been a huge interest in testing if BCG could be used as an immune, uh, immune booster for COVID-19. And th this is uh, under trials right now. So uh, questions like whether BCG is going to be safe to be, so remember that BCG is given right now in uh, uh, early childhood. So for a vaccine to work as a protective uh, uh, vaccine for COVID-19, first of all, it has to offer protection or even uh, you know activate the immune response in individuals who are at high risk. And for COVID-19, who are the individuals who are at high risk? It's the elderly, right? So in elderly, does it work as an agent of activating the immune response? So there is a small study done by ICMR uh, so far, which basically looked at the immune, uh, the, uh, immune activating potential of BCG in the elderly. And that actually has very promising results. A trial on COVID-19 incidence is uh, right now underway. Uh, I think that is in mostly uh, Europe. Um, but yeah, this uh, this uh, speculation has uh, sort of been uh, fanned by a lot of uh, evidences um, that that are in favor of it. Although how specific the immune response will be for COVID nineteen is something that needs to be looked at, and that can only come out from trials. Okay. Uh, so I guess there are no more queries. And uh, student, if you have any query or anything you want to ask, uh, then please drop down the message in WhatsApp group and you can mail me and um, if you don't mind, ma'am, I'll uh, share your email ID to them. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. If they have any idea or to work on something, uh, mm -hmm. they can contact you. Yeah. Sure, sure. Most welcome to Thank you so much, ma'am, for your time. And uh, it was really wonderful and very informative. Uh, and we always uh, hope for your support and contribution in such future. Sure, sure. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Hope uh, this was a fruitful one and a half hours for you. Of course, ma'am. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.